By the time I pulled into what I thought would be a safe place to camp, it was almost entirely dark. I'd started the day just south of Monterey, where the first thing in the morning, I was greeted by a humpback calf breaching the surface just below my campsite along the cliffs near Carmel, California. Setting off on my fifth day out from San Francisco, I imagined that I was continuously followed, or perhaps I did the following, by La Nina, where it would rain day after day and usually all night long for weeks at a time. It was mid-January, so the cold, wet California Nor'wester was in effect, and together they made the conditions much more dangerous and unpredictable. I'd heard that a one-four-mile section of Highway 1 had washed off into the Pacific Ocean the year before and was still under construction. But that was still days away from where I was then, and another story entirely. Because I'd bicycled about 150 miles that day, with intermittent tail and headwind gusts up to 50 knots, I considered myself lucky when I found what I thought would be the perfect place. The ground receded into the cliffs just east of Highway 1 and was surrounded on three sides, so the air was mostly calm and invisibility was nearly certain. It looked like the perfect place for a one-night stay. I had all the necessary gear, Gore-Tex BV, NF down bag, one of the new Univega touring bikes with everything, and what I considered to be most important, a vision-inspired power food diet I dreamt while doing a five-week survival in Yosemite. But that's also another story. The time of year and the weather along the Pacific coast meant night came early and morning came late, so I had to pitch camp as quickly as possible. I remember feeling all at once, both exhilarated and leery. I remember standing completely still, squinting my eyes and scanning everything around me. I extended myself as far and wide as I could, and soon enough discovered the cause of my wariness. We've all had that feeling where one minute you're doing something nonchalant, and the next, you're turning around and looking directly into the eyes of someone behind you. I never did see anyone, but from what I could see, I discovered a large house just above me. It was two stories high and stretched out precariously along a cliff edge, with what looked like multiple rooms and windows, but no lights. It looked as though it was either vacant or abandoned. What was particularly odd was that whenever I would catch myself looking too long, trying to discern even the slightest movement, I was left with a most sickening dread. Someone or something was telling me I wasn't supposed to look. I remembered reading once. He who looks is also seen. Completing my setup, the rain falling even heavier, I pulled everything in, locked the bicycle to a support loop on the tent, stripped, crouched down on all fours into a kind of finger, toehold, then performed a head tuck, rolling upside down onto my back and then folding myself into a closed jackknife and then extending myself the length of the bivy. Greg L. would have been jealous. Because of the gusts of rain, I closed everything up quickly and fell instantly into a deep, dreamless sleep. I can still hear the soft sound of the rain on the Gore-Tex, the pitch dark, the low hum of the surf, the... Sometime later, I got out, buck naked, but warm as toast, and into a driving nor'wester. I had to piss like a greyhound, whip it like a whippet, in the ice-sharded rain with intermittent flashes of lightning that lit up the surrounding area and far out to sea. Turning my back to the gale, I examined the house on the cliff edge. The flashes showed what looked like a three-dimensional black-and-white stock photo out of a low-budget B-movie when a new realization unexpectedly ran over me. I wasn't alone. No, I didn't yell out the proverbially lame B-movie query, is anyone there? I just stood, completely still, and reached out into the dark with my entire self to anything and everything around me. But there was nothing. Whatever it was had either gone or was hidden. I imagined it was shy or afraid to face me, show itself. Whatever was in the house on the cliff edge never did show itself, but was somehow still there, watching. I imagined what it might be thinking. The rest of the night was fitful at best. The rain and wind changed direction and began buffeting my little shelter, threatening to blow me out of my snug little cove 
across Highway 1 and off the cliff into the roiling Pacific. At times it was like I would just start to doze and something would suddenly startle me, like my mind was trying to fall asleep but my body kept saying, No! Eventually, after four or five rounds of that, I decided that because I wasn't going to get to sleep anyway, I would just lay there and listen and feel and think. Thinking, I managed to locate where it was at, the top right corner window looking both down and out over the vast Pacific Ocean. It seemed to be emitting feelings of both calm, alarm, and sadness. It seemed to be waiting, but waiting for what or whom? I imagined it thin and fleeting and female. I called out with my mind that I meant it no harm. Silently, I spoke to the powers that be to watch over and protect me. Some hours later, the wind and rain had stopped, and I heard a foghorn somewhere along the shelf overlooking the sea. I got out, to find myself blanketed by the densest fog I had ever seen. The sky had cleared enough to look straight up and see Orion and the constellation Lepus, the rabbit, and just approaching the western horizon sat a faint, pale, nearly full moon. The light allowed me to see that the entire area was covered in a thick, white fog. I watched it slowly rising along the shelf, across the highway, over me, and up the cliff to the surrounding foothills. It was eerily beautiful and magically surreal because I was used to getting up in the middle of the night when I was on the out, as I called it. I didn't think twice about walking around with just my boots on. With the fog, I was practically clothed, and since no one was out who was probably alive anyway, no one would care. I tied my climber's rope to my bike, which was hooked to the tent around my waist, and walked slowly in the direction of where the foghorn sounded. I had to go slow and feel my way. The fog was so thick. As I moved, the sound at times seemed further away, yet... Somehow, I knew I was getting closer because the composition of the terrain underfoot had changed. It was increasingly smoother, flatter, and sandier. When I bumped into a large metal object slimy with salt and condensation and vibrating like a generator, I knew I'd arrived. I walked part way around to the front and was met with the most ear-shattering noise. But when I retreated to the back, it was like hearing a long, low, muffled tone. For some time I just stood there, engulfed by the cloud, listening to the sound and thinking about the house on the cliff. I must have been out there for the better part of an hour, standing motionless, watching the fog in its seeming sentience, swirling, moving, and later being shoved by the ever-encroaching cold northwest wind back up into the surrounding hills, leaving me a little sad and alone. I no longer needed the climber's rope to find my way back. The rest of the night, I kept waking up over and over with the weirdest feeling as though I was getting sick. My mind was keenly aware of my surroundings, but this time my body was hurting by something or someone invisible to either sight or sound. It felt like parts of me were being attacked, struck or hit over and over again and sometimes by more than one. It drained me to the extent that I passed out multiple times only to wake up feeling utterly spent, exhausted, sick. Reflexively, I would examine my body with both hands, trying to detect any kind of injury or mark, something that might tell me what was happening to me. But there was nothing. If it hadn't been for the morning, though blowing and raining again, I'm not sure I would have been able to get out of there when I did. I managed to ride for only a couple of hours, barely able to stay in the saddle, when a local motel magically presented itself. I slept for almost forty hours. When I awoke, I had the most ravenous appetite. I stayed for three days and nights, eating, drinking, sleeping, watching cable television, and sighting humpbacks and sea otters playing in the kelp. I counted myself lucky, blessed, to still be alive. Whatever it was wanted me more than I wanted it. I read somewhere, From the moment we are born we are dying. It is for each of us to decide when that will be. During my youth I had the chance to attend summer camp only once, and while most of my experience was pleasant, there was one event that etched itself into my memory more than anything else. I was around 12 or 13 years old, and my birthday fell during the summer. 
The specifics of my age escape me now, but what's more important is the insight it gives into my youthful character. In school, I occupied a middle ground in the popularity hierarchy. I wasn't bullied or particularly outstanding, and I dabbled in sports without achieving any notable success. I fell into that gray area between the popular and less popular kids. However, at camp, all these distinctions seemed to dissolve. I arrived without knowing anyone, which was perfectly fine by me. I relished the opportunity to meet new people and embark on fresh adventures. The camp was divided into multiple cabins, with the boys' cabins situated on one side and the girls' cabins on the other. Looking back, it seems a tad amusing that the camp organizers sought to keep the genders separated during nighttime, presumably to prevent any nocturnal escapades. Upon arriving at the camp, I was among the early arrivals and had the privilege of selecting my bunk. I chose a top bunk tucked away at the back of the cabin. The most enticing feature was a window that opened up to a view of the woods. I figured if I had trouble sleeping, a likely occurrence in an unfamiliar bed, I could entertain myself by gazing out into the forest. The window faced away from the camp, adding an eerie ambiance as the moonlight filtered through the trees. The initial days at camp passed without incident, filled with exciting activities, some less thrilling moments, the formation of new friendships, and surprisingly decent camp food. However, sleep continued to elude me, a common affliction when I sleep away from home. It was on one particular night, a few weeks into the camp, that my stay took an unexpected turn. I lay on my back in bed, surrounded by the sounds of other campers' snores. I was convinced that everyone else had succumbed to slumber, leaving me as the sole night owl. So, I stared out the window, lost in thought. As I watched, a sudden movement in the forest caught my attention. A camp counselor, a teenager who oversaw a neighboring cabin, emerged from around the corner of my cabin. He was a robust, tall guy, involved in high school baseball and football. The counselor moved about with a flashlight, scanning the woods and mumbling something, though his words were too faint to discern. Out of nowhere, I was jolted upright as a massive figure burst from the trees, violently tackling the counselor to the ground. The assailant, much larger, began pummeling the counselor as he fell. In my panic, I let out a scream, an instinctual reaction I had never experienced before or since. The cabin erupted into chaos as my counselor hurried over to me, demanding to know what had happened. He glanced out the window and saw the commotion, instructing us to stay inside while he rushed to aid his fellow counselor. Nevertheless, this was a cabin filled with around a dozen teenage boys, most hailing from rural backgrounds. It was virtually impossible for them to stay put when they knew someone was in trouble. Predictably, they all rushed outside. I remained rooted at the window, watching everything unfold. While the second counselor struggled to overpower the intruder, a few of the older boys came to his assistance, eventually managing to pull the assailant away with the second counselor's help. A blaring alarm horn added to the surreal atmosphere as other camp counselors arrived, collectively subduing the man. It turned out that he was a fugitive with a warrant for a violent crime, hiding near the river adjacent to the camp. He had ventured close to the camp, likely in search of food. Like me, the counselor had trouble sleeping in an unfamiliar place and noticed something amiss. The episode ultimately concluded on a positive note. The sight of that man springing from the shadows had been a nightmarish experience, but the collective efforts of the pubescent boys brimming with testosterone, helped the counselor, ensuring a favorable outcome. Nonetheless, that incident haunted my thoughts for a long time. Witnessing the sudden emergence of a stranger from the depths of the forest was a chilling experience. It was a poignant reminder that even a seemingly tranquil summer camp can hold unforeseen challenges, and it is the collective strength of the community that can turn the tide in favor of safety and well-being. This is a weird story. It happened when I was out on a camping trip by myself. I have been camping by myself for as long as I can remember. Just to give you a bit of an idea, I am an only child. I grew up out in the country, 
Although I had plenty of cousins, we didn't live very close to each other. But I always liked camping. So I began camping out by myself quite a bit. I never had any strange or really scary experiences when I was younger and camping. I wasn't scared of the dark, and I was never afraid when I was out camping on my own. I always felt like I was safe in the environment that I was comfortable with. I am not going to go into a lot of detail about the camping trip, just to take up space. I will give you a little bit of background, though. This happened when I was 25 years old. I was taking a week-long camping trip in the summer. The place that I was camping in was not an official campground. It was in the hills behind the property that one of my aunts lived on, so technically I was not supposed to be there. I was camped out at a very good spot on a hill. I could go downhill to a creek in order to get water, but I liked being up on the hill because it was high and I had a really good view. I kept a fire burning at all times. It was necessary, of course. If you've been camping for a decent period of time, you would know how important a fire can be. I was sleeping and not really sure what time it was, but when I opened my eyes it was still very dark around me. There was light, but it was coming from outside of the tent and it was my fire. I looked around trying to figure out what woke me up. Normally I can sleep through anything. And that's when I noticed the scariest thing I had ever seen in my life. The fire illuminated a wall of the tent, but it also revealed something else. It showed me a shadow. It was the shadow of a large man who was sitting at my fire. I felt a jolt, or sort of a jarring feeling, and I just barely kept myself from making a noise. This was a weird and unprecedented event, and I really had no idea how I should react. I decided the smartest thing to do was to not call attention to the fact that I had woken up and that I had noticed him out there. Trying to make as little movement as possible, I slowly reached over to my backpack. I had a fillet knife that I used to prepare fish from the creek. Slowly bringing the backpack closer to me, I reached in as quiet as I could and extracted the knife from inside of it. I kept glancing back over at the shadow to see if it had moved or not. But it hadn't. I guess on some level that was comforting because he hadn't noticed that I was up or moving. I lay there for who knows how long in the dark, holding that fillet knife close to me. I kept waiting to see what this stranger was going to do. He just kept by the fire and I assume occasionally looking over at the tent. Perhaps he was expecting me to get up or something like that. I don't know. I tried to tell myself that maybe it was nothing. Perhaps it was just the owner of the property, and he was waiting for me to get up and tell him to get off of his land. But that didn't make much sense to me. If he wanted me gone, he would have woken me up. But also, if he was there to kill me, maybe he would have woken me up too. Finally, he did something. But it wasn't something I wanted to see. I watched as the man stood up and he walked over to the tent. He stopped when he got to the door flap of the tent. I felt my heart begin to beat really fast. I slowly moved my hand, holding the knife close to me, but in such a way that I could strike if the guy opened my tent and attacked me. But instead, he just stood there in front of the tent. I could feel him looking at me through the tent even though I knew that he really wasn't. It was creepy and weird and very uncomfortable. After I don't know how long, he finally moved away. But rather than sit back in front of the fire, the man walked out of sight. I had no idea where he went, but I was not prepared to go back to sleep. I had no idea if he was hanging out in the woods waiting for me to start snoring or something. I couldn't go back to sleep. All I could do was wait until morning. And the moment day broke, I packed up my camp and ended my camping trip early. I was shaken at the time. But nothing bad happened. I now only camp in places where I am allowed to do it.